this is 3050 uh, week 2 lecture 3 and today we're going to do a uh, translational mechanical systems so this is basically section 2.5 in your book I believe so it's basically translational oops, mechanical system transfer functions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow a different approach from your book in the sense I'm assuming you guys are going to do the reading. So I'll try to give you the conceptual ideas behind this. And that's pretty much how I'm going to teach this differently. In other words, I'm going to basically write the differential equation down. So we'll look at the different translational mechanical system components, look at the differential equation, and then I'm going to go to the transfer function. So all in like one example, because it's all like related. All right. All right. So first of all, mechanical systems are analogous to electrical system. Analogous to and I think I misspelled analogous. I think it's analogy. So it's A N A L O G U G O U S. Analogous to electrical systems. And uh, table 2.4. I have an electronic copy of the book I'm looking at on page 62. Is important. Okay. I'm not going to cut and paste it like I did for electrical. We should actually go through this. So let's go through it. So let me do one extra column, which is basically the electrical analogy in a different color. But for now, let's do the mechanical, and then let me ask you what the electrical analogy is. So here is a mechanical component. So this is the spring, okay? So this is the direction of positive displacement, x of t. This is, oops, how the force F is applied, okay? What are the dimensions of K? What are the units? Newton per meter. What is another name for it? You know what it's called? Spring constant, okay? So in the time domain, f of t is k times x of t. Do you know whose law this is? Hook, Robert Hook, Hook's law, okay? So s is, k is a constant, I'm sorry, not s. So here is the s domain. Let me actually move this a little bit more to the left so I have, oops, so I have room for another column, which is impedance. And admittance, by the way, is the reciprocal of impedance. We really don't use admittance per se in systems theory. Sorry, in dynamical systems theory, I'm sorry. We do use admittance. Where have you heard of the term admittance? 2060. They use it in DSP a lot. That's a point. Okay, so what is the S domain expression of this? Assuming the Laplace transform of F, little f is big F, and X is capital X of S. X is capital X of S. So what's the Laplace transform of this? So just L. So F of S is what? Kx of S, that's it. Okay? So in this case, we define the impedance as force over displacement. In that case, we get K as your impedance, okay? But let's finish this, and you will see this definition of impedance doesn't directly correspond to the electrical analogy, okay? Because according to this, it seems like the spring is the resistor, right? Because the impedance of a resistor is, simple, is a constant, yes? Electrically, but you know that's not true. But let's just go through the mechanical components and look at the electrical analogy. The so next one is the dampener. 
So same thing in the sense here is f of t. Here is the positive direction of displacement. I don't know if your book uses d or dv. I'll just use d. And here, f of t is d times dx dt. Okay? So given this, d is the coefficient of dampening. Right? What do you think are the dimensions of d? So what are the dimensions of this? Meters per second, okay? What do you want on the left hand? What are the dimensions on the left hand side? Force. Newtons, okay? So what should this be? This is meters per second. I want newtons, yes? So what should D be? Newton. Newton per So what are the dimensions of D? This is meters per second. This is newtons. So how do I get newtons out of this? Like what should D be? No, newtons, right. So how do I? Well, just newton per what? And then we can simplify. Newton per? Newton per meter per second or newton seconds per meter, yes? So you plug this in here, Newton seconds per meter. So you get meters per second. It might be, like Scott said, there might be a kilogram in here, okay? But this is the SI unit. Well, not, I'm sorry, it's not SI unit. <laughs> this is the units. It's not an S, uh, D is not an SI quantity. All right, now let's Laplace this guy. You get F of S is S D X of S. I'm assuming zero initial conditions, okay? So you can compute the impedance as SD, okay? Now, let's look at the electrical analogy before we go on to the next final component, which is going to be the mass. But let's look at this. What is the electrical analogy of the dampener? Resistor, okay? Intuitively, that's what you want, yes? So what is the impedance of the resistor? R. Yes? But the impedance here is S times D. Yes? You don't want that. You want only D. Okay? So in that case, you should define... So I'll, actually, I put this in red. I'll leave it in red. Note that is D. Yes? So if I define this as my impedance, what do you think S times X of S is in the time domain? What is this quantity? So if you multiply by S in the Laplace domain, what are you doing in the time domain? Remember from last lecture? Huh? Derivative, yes? So taking the derivative of X, what is DX DT? What's it called? Velocity. So in other words, if you want the exact electrical analogy, you should define your impedance as force to velocity, not displacement. Is that clear? We just don't do that. This is what, I mean, not we, the mechanical engineers, this, this world is. Just as a aside. Okay? Because we define impedance as force to displacement, we don't get the exact analogy. That's it. So in this case, the electrical analogy should be the capacitor. So one more, and I'm not going to write the impedance there, which is the inductor. So that's the mass. Let's put the mass in. Okay. So the SI unit of mass, like Scott alluded to earlier, is the kilogram, okay? So F of T is M D squared X by DT squared, I mean D squared X DT squared. So F of S is now going to be S squared M X of S, okay? So the impedance, you can see there's a square now, 
s square x of s, okay? And if you make this definition that uh, the impedance is forces to velocity, you will get nice analogies, but again, we just do forces to displacement. So anyway, these are the mechanical components. Now, an important point, when you look at mechanical systems, in my, well, it's not an important point, okay? In my opinion, so IMO, it is much easier to understand and visualize the different degrees of freedom in your in our translational and it's true for rotational as well but let's stick to translational right now mechanical system and then set up corresponding equations in time domain and then oops, spell and then Laplace this okay to get into the S domain so basically if you read your book he talks about how you can look at the number of impedances connected to one degree of freedom, put the signs in. You're welcome to use that method. I'm not going to do that because uh, it's more intuitive for me to just look at how each degree of freedom moves right, and then figure out what the correct signs are. So I'll do like a few, couple of problems. That's the method I'm going to follow. You're welcome to do the number of impedances connected to, the no, to that degree of freedom. And so let's look at an example. So this is example... Two, seven. This is not a assessment, skill assessment exercise. It's just an example. I want to do this. So you have another reference to your book. So the question is, find transfer function g of s is defined as x2 of s over f of s. So here is our little system. And um, I should have added my keyboard. So let me do that because it's my handwriting is horrible. And my drawing is even worse. So, all right, as my keyboard is starting up, let me get the book out. All my books. Question? Some keyboards active. So this was, I said, on page 65. That's not, uh, so it's only 46. So I'm 19 off. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so let's look at this guy. Zoom in further. So before we get started, so on the exam, on the first exam, I'll tell you how many degrees of freedom your system has. But starting with subsequent exams, I won't tell you. Okay? So it's up to you to start getting into the habit of figuring it out. Here, can somebody tell me how this has two degrees of freedom? Suppose I didn't give this to you. Yeah? No, it doesn't. This is all translational, almost right. It's allowed to move translationally, like Chris said is correct, but it's not rotating, right? That's a good point. This is just translation. Oh, these are dampeners. Oh, great question. What are these? No. Huh? Friction. So these are uh, good, good points. So these are coefficients of friction, okay? Yes, so like Tim, right? So like Tim said, this can move back and forth. This can also move back and forth, all right? Independent of the other. Yes, I mean, they're coupled. 
So that's why it has two degrees of freedom. Can you see that? So I can hold this. I can hold this guy. I can still move this. I can hold this guy and I can still move this. Yes? So I can get into the habit of figuring out how many degrees of freedom it has. It's not difficult if you intuitively think about what's going to go on physically. Okay. So unlike electrical circuits, mechanical systems and mechanical engineers have this huge advantage. In the sense, at least in my opinion, they can visualize the movement of mechanical systems. For electrical circuits, we really cannot... For low frequency, you can treat electrons as a particle. Right? For higher frequency, they're basically waves. Right? So you really don't think about visualizing uh, like electric circuits in this respect. That's what I mean. Okay? So everybody understand how this has two degrees of freedom? And we're going to use that fact to write the equations of motion. And these are coefficients of static friction, by the way. Okay? Because they act till you start moving. What it looks like. Okay. So anyway, copy this electric graphic. To there it is. All right. Okay. So as we correctly figured out, system has two degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom is abbreviated DOF, uh, full stop. Hence, we will have to set up, and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm always going to do it in the time domain first, and then I'm going to take it to the Laplace domain. If you're confident after enough practice, you can directly go to the Laplace domain. It's up to you. Right? I'm not going to do that. We'll have to set up a system of equations for x1, the first displacement, and x2 of t, where is our input coming on? It's pushing this mass f. Okay? Input is f of t and obviously this is the positive direction of displacement for both masses okay so to set up system of equations if you want a step by step method here it is okay two steps two steps step 1 is apply principle of superposition that is a motion at one degree of freedom one at a time while holding the other the other could be multiple degrees of freedoms okay still is that clear number 2 draw a free body diagram. Have you done this in physics? Yeah, so that's it. Just got to be careful of the signs, okay? So if in red, very important mistake will occur in signs, okay? And that's why I always start in the time domain. For me, it's much easier to see. Like I said, maybe with enough practice or with your enough skills, you have more skills than I do. And you can just write it in the S domain. I can't. So let's do this. So at x1, So what do I got? What are the so I'm gonna look at the forces on M1, okay, due to the motion of M1 alone. Yes, this is being held still. Uh -oh. Okay. And then I'm gonna look at the forces on M1 when M2 is moving. Yes. So first M1 is moving, next M2 is moving, but I'm gonna look at the forces on M1. Is that clear? So just be careful of the sign. Alright, let me try to zoom out and draw this. So this is on forces. Oh, crap, did it crash? Let's try this again. That. There it is. So forces on M1 due to 
the motion of m1 only okay so i'm just looking at m1 right now so let's look at m1 because i mean it's technically x1 because that's my degree of freedom but i have a mass there okay so let me zoom out hopefully we can see both at the same time uh, no. yeah, 50 percent all right yeah just question great question do the springs pull apart or do they compress depends on which you're moving yes they don't rotate is that what you're asking there's no torsional thing to them yeah they are yes they are addressed there's no yes the starting point is all addressed okay there are no initial conditions to the system question yeah they'll be active in both directions unless i say so they're like they compress and stretch yeah yeah equal there's no like uh, backlash or anything like that no no it's basically we are finding transfer function yes so your initial conditions are going to be zero if they are not going to be zero i'll let you know okay we'll probably do pro more examples like that they're in i think they're in the back of the book but we'll see all right okay so only m1 is moving so what are the forces so first of all the direction of positive displacement is to the right can you see that okay so what happens so let's look at the spring k1 so as m1 moves to the right in which okay easy first here is my force f of t okay pushing to the right as m1 moves to the right which direction number one listen to the full question don't jump like jeopardy right which direction is the spring going to act in question one question two what is the expression for the force due to the spring so question one which direct or question one part a which direction is the force due to the spring going to act as m1 moves to the right huh to the left yes so what is the expression sorry it's hook's law but what is the exact correct expression is it negative kx have you taken care of the negative sign yeah you have taken care of the negative sign so there's no the negative sign is here yes so what's the expression kx but what k and what x that's my question i mean kx everybody knows k1 what's the x x1 right x2 is not moving that's the advantage of superposition right you can again do it like physics i think even in physics they ask you to draw a free body diagram that's what because that these people if you're careful in these two steps it's kind of hard to get the signs wrong unless you cannot visualize how it's moving physically right that is how the spring is acting physically I, I recommend that we not be lazy including me and actually follow these two steps it takes a little bit more time but it's very easy to avoid sign errors yeah. all right so is this clear okay then what else is there these oh there's look there's one two there's three right here okay don't forget this guy so let's start with and of course there's the mass itself right there's four one two three four yes so let's resolve them uh, let's see uh, what did i do it doesn't matter what so let's look at you agree that all these forces are going to be acting to the left right yes they all oppose this motion no on this is this clear so that's again be very careful scott says it's easy to get confused as this yeah the spring is compressing but on m1 it's going to be acting to the left so be very careful right any questions on that yes this spring and this dampener are going to in compress but on m1 they're going to oppose its motion any questions on that that's a that's the only place where you can make a sign error right if any if you're again if you're do these two things and you're careful it's not it's this is easy points on the exam right all right so now let's look at fv what the heck is this this is why i got to zoom in 
All right, just remember what are all the different forces are. Fe3, K2, Fe1, right? So this is Fe3, this is K2, and this is Fe1, and of course, there's also the mass, okay? So it's always X1, right? Is that clear? That's the, it's X1 of T, because the other one is being held still. So this fellow is going to be Fe3, dx1 dt x1 dot velocity yes it's a dampener what about the k2 guy what's the expression for the force acting on mass m1 k2 x1 what about this guy it's fv1 this this fellow down here friction it's just like this guy so what is this Fv1 times what? Yeah, dx1 dt. Okay, now what about the mass? So what does uh, Newton's second law say? The force due to a mass is, some of the forces is mass times acceleration. So force due to a mass is what? We did it up here. M times A, correct? So what is it exactly? Is what is the m? What is the d squared x by dt squared? Yes, m1 x1 double dot. I talked about the dot notation. Yes, is that clear? So, two things the sign or the direction they all oppose this motion except the input force because that's pushing it, and the expression, the magnitudes, if you will. Okay, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Which one? Yeah, we are assuming that this force here, I mean, this. Yeah, that's the external force. Force is an M1. Yeah, we, this is moving. That's why you have all these are non zero. Forces on M1 due to the motion of M1 alone. Okay? So good questions. Uh, any other questions? All right. We're not done yet because there's another degree of freedom. So forces, we are still looking at M1. This is going to go back to Scott's point of you have to be careful of the direction of these guys. Due to the motion of M2 only. Okay? So again, let me zoom out. Let me draw my mass. Okay, I'll use the same color. M1, this is still X1. Yes, that doesn't change. We're talking about M1. This is like, we're talking about degree of freedom X1, which has mass M1 attached to it. Okay. So let me zoom out and tell me. So as I move this, which direction? Do I move to the right or to the left? To the right. Okay, that's the direction of positive displacement. What are the forces? Again, two things. What is the direction of the forces acting on M1? And what is their expression? So, let's see. So let's go back to Scott's point. So, this is moving to the right. Okay? I'm looking at the forces acting on this. So, can you, you should be able to directly tell me what are the components that cause forces on this. Yes? Which ones? These two, yes? Now, as I move this to the right, what is the direction of the forces due to these two components on M1, not M2? To the right. Is that clear? On M2, it's going to push to the left. These two. But we don't care about M2 right now. Is that clear? We are looking only at M1. Let me go back. So there are two of them. Fe3 x2 dot K2 x2 corresponding to these two components. Note, that's point number one. Point number two, note the displacement. It's x2, not x1 because x2 is moving. And you really don't care about this this and this. 
because they're acting on x2 we don't care about that we only care about x1 is that clear this is superposition okay well this is basically one and two applied with care okay so combining these two we're going to get the equation of motion at x1 right so we're going to get let's look at the signs right so there are let me just write it out okay there are many ways to write this once you get this okay once you get this free body diagram correctly there are many ways to write the equation of motion i'm going to write it like one way and then we'll look at it as it's all just the signs right? we'll look at it in more detail so let's write this so i'm going to say on one side i'm going to put the forces that are opposing f Okay, so let me put F on the other side. So this is the input force. Is that clear? So let me talk about it as I write this. So if I move everything to one side, this will be negative. You see that? It'll be Ft minus M1x1 double dot. It's exactly what this picture tells you. So let's see. Plus F of V1 plus F of V3 X1 dot. Yes? plus k1 plus k2 x1 okay we're not done yet we have to put these two in but you see that all of these are on one side of the equation f is on the other side so these oppose f and that's correct and if you can see this without drawing the free body diagram i recommend i can't see it but i have to draw the free body diagram and I recommend you don't write this directly unless you're like a hot shot like mechanical engineer you can see this because you I make sign errors okay. so I always do step by step because I'm not in Mickey I mean I can visualize how this moves but not like in my head I have to draw it okay now what about this guy all right now let's see if you really understand this I'm going to write this on this side of the equation okay so what are the signs negative is that clear so this is negative because they're acting in the same direction as f so this is minus fv3 x2 dot minus k2 x2 okay so here is the first equation of motion we're not done we have to look at m2 but is this clear okay it, it's kind of obvious but you, you got to practice right it's very easy to make sign errors here and i highly recommend you do this right so then it's almost almost impossible right? unless you visualize this motion wrong and that's hard to get if you just take your time right questions so let's do m2 oh shit how much time is this i just been like oh we got 15 minutes Whew. yeah yes there's mass on x1 that's what this is Okay, it's basically it's the force like how does the degree of freedom x1 change as i apply an external force that's exactly what's going on and there is a mass there which causes inertia yeah yes it's inertia so you say inertia well this is translational inertia or inertia when we look at rotational mechanical systems we'll see that you have a moment of inertia so it will be i times theta double dot or i alpha you might have seen some of the torques equals i alpha that's the rotational equivalent of newton's second law of motion it's exactly what it is right no in this case there is friction yeah so in an ideal system if there's no friction this would still act okay all right so now we got to look at x2 Ah oh boy. So, I think there are some symmetries here. Forces on M two, okay, due to the motion of M two alone. Then forces on M two 
due to motion of M1 alone. Okay. So let's look at this. So here's our friend M2. So it's again going to move to the right. But this is X2. Okay. So as I push this fellow to the right, because that's the positive direction of displacement, how many components, how many forces act on it? So as this moves to the right, how many act on it? <laughs> no, it's both wrong. Five. One, two, three, four, five. There is no external force on M2. That's only on M1. Yeah, be careful, right? <laughs> Is that clear? It's five, one, two, three, four, five. Okay? Are they all going to oppose M2? Yes. Okay? Because it's the motion, it's a force on M2. Okay? This spring compresses, this spring stretches. Okay? But on M2, they're, they're going to oppose it. If not, you'll have perpetual motion. Yes? So I'll write down all the forces. All right. Uh, so the mass is what? It's going to go this way. It's M2, X2, double dot. And then there was a spring here, K2, right? X2. And there's a friction here, right? What was that called? Yeah, K2, FV2, K3. Okay. So this is FV2, X2 dot. Yes. And this fellow is going to oppose this as well. K3X2. Is that clear? 1, 2, 3, 4. Where's the fifth one? Oh, yeah, yeah there, was, there is no 5. I'm sorry. Wait, is that a damper? Oh, yeah. There, there is 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I forgot this guy. Yes? So let's see. Yeah, there is no damper. There's one more right there. What was that? FV3? Next two down. There you go. It right. so should be fine. Okay? Yeah, so again, it's easy to miss this. Just, just be careful. Any questions on this? Now, I should become an expert at this. So there's M2 still moving. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. M2 still. I'm sorry. It's still on it. You're still looking at M2, but it's still. X1 is moving to the right. Okay? So what are the forces acting on M2 in which direction? So this is going to move to the right. So these two are the components of interest. Yes. So it's going to be this guy pushing this fellow. But this guy is going to oppose M1 moving. Yes. But on M2, it's going to push to the right. No, no, no. This is not the spring. This is the dampener. The spring is here. K2. I mean, think about it physically, right? I have two masses. If I push this guy, this guy is going to move. Yes, that's what I mean. Like, think physically. But on M1, that it's going to oppose the motion on M1, right? But we already took care of that. It's just like an electrical circuit. It's the exact analogy, but... Mechanical systems, again, it's much easier to visualize like masses moving, etc. Right? Okay. So here we go. So let's see. This is M2, X2, double dot. Notice the way I write it, right? I write acceleration first. So it's dot, 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 and then the function itself. That's You should systematically write it. So this is FV2 plus FV3 times X2 dot plus K2 plus K3 times X2 minus FV3X and I screwed this up. See, you got to be careful. It's X1. Yes, it's not X2 because X1 is moving. So, I mean, just pay attention, right? Like, as you're writing, think, oops, again, I didn't think there. K2X1 equals zero. No force. Is that clear? Huh? Where? This one? Yeah. No. Oh, 
That's my beautiful single dot. Okay. <laughs> it's not double dot. All right. Okay. So yeah, looking good. All right. So any questions on this? So these are the two. Uh, let me write out the equations. Uh, I mean, let me copy them. These are our equations of motion. Okay. So copy. Let's see. Therefore, equations of motion are. This is one. Okay. Okay. Let me just write it like this, and you will see why. Minus k2 x2 equals f of t, and then this fellow. Okay. Equals zero. No. Good point. The lower equation should not equal f of t because my external force is acting on f m1. It's not acting on m2. These are the forces on m2. My f is acting only on m1. Is that clear? Very important. It's not equal to f. Okay. Look at this. Right. This is what I meant by if you can, you can really eyeball this directly. In the sense, okay. Let me just. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the Laplace transform of this, right? And you will see what I mean. So this is m1 s squared plus f v1 plus f v3 s plus k1 plus k2 x1 of s. So how did I get this? Laplace transform of this guy is s squared x1. Remember, we are finding transfer functions, no initial conditions. This is plus, so this is s squared x1, this is s x1, this is x1. So I factor out an x1 of s, I get s squared s, no s to the zeroth term, and the appropriate coefficients. Is that clear? Minus f v3 times s plus k2 times x2 of s equals f of s. Okay? And then the Laplace transform of the second equation is what? This one? This guy? This one? Okay, all right. okay. so let me know if I make mistakes, all right? So M2S squared plus FV2 plus FV3S plus k2 plus k3 x2 of s, OK? OK, I, hold on. I'm going to write it. This is correct, but let me let me do something. Right. This is what I wanted to show you. Just take that out. So I'm going to write the x1 first. OK, so this is going to be minus FV3S plus K2 X1 of S. In other words, I wrote the Laplace transform of this guy as the first expression, and you'll see why. Right? Plus M2S squared plus FV2 plus FV3 plus K2 plus K3 times X1 of S equals 0. Okay? Uh, oh, x2. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me fix that. But, oh, man, mine's up. Mine. So this should be x2 because the other one is x1. Okay. Here is x2. So, this is what I want you to notice. I can write this in what is called matrix form. Okay? And we're going to continue with this next time. Just notice something about this matrix. Hmm. 
What do you notice about this matrix? And I'm missing an S because I'm going through this pretty fast. Right there, K2 plus K3, which I shouldn't do. X1 of S, X2 of S equals F of S, zero. All right. So this is where we're going to stop. I mean, I'm going to stop writing, but uh, let's discuss this and then take all it today. All right. So let's look at this matrix. What do you notice about, first of all, do all of you, have, all of you have seen matrices, right? Yes. You know how this works, this mul matrix multiplication. That's the most important thing in this course. You know how this matrix multiplication gets you, gets us these equations. Yes. So these rows, I mean, these, this row times this column and this row times this column again. Okay. Is that clear? What do you notice about this matrix? What kind of a matrix is it? It's a two by two, but what do you notice? What do you see? Something should pop out. Oh yeah. What, what's up with the, yeah, what, what about the coefficients? Huh? Which are the same? No, the diagonal is this one. This is the off diagonal. But they're the same. Correct? What kind of a matrix is this? So if I take the transpose of this matrix, what do I get? How do I take the transpose? So I make the rows columns and columns rows, yes? So what is the transpose of this matrix? So if this is A, so let's, well, I promised I won't write, but I have to write. So this is A times X of S equals F of S, a big F if you will. So X star, whatever, F star. So A transpose, notice A transpose is what? In terms of A, what is it? What happens if I take the transpose of this matrix? I make the rows columns. Okay. It's it's not nothing. It's what? It's the same. Okay. It's a symmetric matrix. And that's what you will get for the system intuitively because these two are the components that connect the two masses, the two degrees of freedom. So these are all checks. Let's say you got here like K1, you screwed up, right? Guaranteed. There's no way this can be, I mean, this matrix has to be symmetric. That's my point, okay? All right, we're not done with this problem because the problem asks you to find X2 over F. So we'll continue that next week, right? So this involves a lot of work now. So you better be good at MATLAB or your calculators or you have to do this by hand. And especially symbolic, it involves a lot of computations, right? But we'll continue this like next time. You're done.